I'm going to turn the uh, screens back to Vilma for the readings this morning. Yes. Uh, yes. Cage Bird by Maya Angelou. A free bird leaps on the back of the wind and floats downstream till the current ends and dips its wing in the orange sun rays and dares to claim the sky. But a bird that stalks down his narrow cage can seldom see through his bars of rage. His wings are clipped and his feet are tied, so he opens his throat to sing. The cage bird sings with a fearful trill of things unknown but longed for still, and his tune is heard on the distant hill, for the cage bird sings of freedom. The free bird thinks of another breeze, and the trade winds soft through the sighing trees, and the fat worms waiting on a dawn bright lawn, and he names the sky his own. But a cage bird stands on the grave of dreams. The shadow shouts and a nightmare scream. His wings are clipped and his feet are tied. So he opens his throat to sing. The cage bird sings with a fearful trill of things unknown but long for still. And his tune is heard on the distant hill for the cage bird sings of freedom. The next reading is called To Be of Use, and it's a poem by Margie Piercy. The people I love best jump into work head first without dallying in the shallows and swim off with the shore strokes almost out of sight. They seem to become natives of that element the black sleek heads of seals, bouncing like half-submerged balls. I love people who harness themselves as an ox to a heavy cart, who pull like water buffalo with massive patience, who strain in the mud and the muck to move things forward, who do what has to be done again and again. I want to be with people who submerge in the task, go into the fields to harvest and work in a row and pass the bags along, who are not parlor generals and field deserters, but move in a common rhythm when the food must come in or the fire be put out. The work of the world is common as mud, botched, it smears and hands, crumbles to dust, but the thing worth doing well done has a shape that satisfies clean and evident. Green amphoras for wine or oil, hopey vases that held corn are put in museums, but you know, they were made to be used. The pitcher cries for water to carry and a person for work that is real. May we walk in its light, offered as wisdom for the journey. May we walk in its light. I'm just going to check again. I've got another chat. Is the volume, the volume is working all right for everybody. I also want to just um, Welcome Tina on this. I think she's on a, you can't see her face maybe, but Tina is our, our dear and cherished refugee who is still waiting uh, to be brought across the Atlantic Ocean to live here in Toronto. And so uh, thank you, Dennis, for greeting her. And Tina, we're with you. We, we love you. And there she is there up in the sky. Wave. If we could all wave to our refugee, our, our, our own Tina there. Good to see you. Um, we're, 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 still, we're still waiting for you. We want you here. Uh, yeah, okay. I'm coming soon. <laughs> You're coming soon. Okay. Good to hear you. Thanks, Thanks for Dennis, for um, alerting us. I didn't see the screen. Um, I, I'm super pleased 
to have a, a, not a guest speaker, uh, but a, a part of us uh, speaking this morning for Women Rock, uh, Sarah. And, and uh, after Sarah speaks, we're going to... Um, we're going to toss our rocks in celebration of, of particular women. So uh, I'll ask Sarah now to, to uh, take center screen and share with us um, on, the, on the topic of women, but the topic beneath that of the overcoming of difficulties and expressing oneself uh, with, with honor, with respect, with joy. Uh, Sarah? Thank you so much. And I'm, I'm going to share my screen so that I can, uh, can share some images. So I'll, I will just start with that. Let's see. Here we go. Okay. So I I'm honored to share in West Hills Woman Rock gathering today. And I wanted first to share just a note on content that I will be speaking about topics that include birth and infertility and loss, as well as violence against women. And I know that these can be difficult and painful things to hear about. And uh, so I name that and also name that if, if something comes up for you that you would like to speak about, then please do feel free to message me after the service um, if you wanted to talk. So this is a message of optimistic hope, but it's grounded in the diverse experiences of women who have lived through pain and joy. And whenever I speak about women and feminism, it feels important to clarify that for me, that means intersectional feminism. That's the acknowledgement that power and privilege show up differently in our lives based on multiple factors of identity and experience. So for instance, my experience is shaped by being a white settler, middle-class, cisgendered, queer woman. Some feminism bases itself just in the biological experience of being born in a woman's body, which is referred to as assigned female at birth. For those of us who are cisgendered, that means when we were born, the adults in the room looked at our external genitals and said, it's a boy or it's a girl, and they guessed correctly. But for those who are trans, intersex, or non-binary, that guess wasn't right. And it's important for me to have space for trans and non-binary people as well, especially when we are celebrating women and naming that the experience of women is quite, of being a woman is quite diverse. Today is also the International Day for the Elimination of Racism. And so it's important that feminism also reflects intersections of race and gender. Women rock when we draw a wider circle of inclusion. Women rock when we don't use the oppression of one group to justify the oppression of another. I chose Maya Angelou's poem, Cage Bird, and Marge Piercy's To Be of Use, because they speak of the struggle faced by those who are marginalized, as well as the resilience and hope of women and all those who labor for a world more just. I'm not a huge sports fan, um, but I grew up with a father who coached high school girls sports and argued for more funding and more gym time for girls basketball. And uh, this past week, I um, printed the, the NCAA bracket for my dad and uh, for his uh, basketball, um, I don't know what this is called, but when you, for the basketball bracket for the college basketball and I, um, the internet being the way it is, um, suddenly noticed showing up on my social media things about um, the contrast between the men's and women's weight rooms for college basketball teams. So you can see over here, this one little individual weight rack, this was um, the Oregon women's weight room. Um, it's just one weight rack. On the other side, we can see the men's weight room, which um, the whole team could be lifting weights at the same time. 
the women's team is at a clear disadvantage because I'm pretty sure that lifting weights helps you play basketball better. I'm not an expert, but I figured that was a good guess. So being aware of the big and small ways that privilege shows up in different arenas is an important piece of understanding and working for change. Here in Canada, one of the most prominent women in the Canadian military resigned this week, saying she's disgusted by ongoing reports of sexual misconduct in the armed forces and dismayed that it's taken so long for the, the problem to come to the forefront. This is Lieutenant Colonel Eleanor Taylor. She was the deputy commander of the 36th Brigade Group and is a distinguished veteran of combat in Afghanistan. She says, I'm sickened by ongoing investigations of sexual misconduct among our key leaders, but unfortunately I'm not surprised. I'm also certain that the scope of the problem has yet to be fully exposed. Throughout my career, I have observed insidious and inappropriate use of power for sexual exploitation. And we also heard of the shooting death of eight people in Atlanta massage parlors, most of whom were Asian women. Robert Aaron Long was charged with the murders and has blamed sex addiction and reported that he has visited sex workers at massage parlors. And as someone who works, um, among other things, as a sex therapist, I can say that sex addiction is not a diagnosis and certainly not an excuse for any such crime. This comes at a time when hate crimes and incidents of harassment against people of Asian descent are increasing. And this image is from the Butterfly Network, which is a local group of sex work advocacy. And they have a petition that um, I will share later in the chat that is demanding rights for migrant women employed in sex work here in Canada. In the context of hate, violence, exclusion and marginalization, we gather to celebrate the resilience of women. And we're going to begin with art. I have some paintings that I'd like to share with you. But what makes them of particular significance to me is the stories of the artists and how they interact with their art. Oh, we jumped ahead. Here, this is Lucida Hurtado, who created art for 80 years. Um, she died just last year at the age of 99. She was active and had small art shows in the beginning of her career. But her work may never have been widely exhibited if it hadn't been discovered by the person she hired to go through the archive of her husband's art. While he was sorting through the art of Lee Mulliken, her daughter's husband, he found works that were signed LH in a style that he didn't recognize. Herdado's art had been filed away and largely ignored, although she had never stopped painting. And here's more of her work. She painted after her family had gone to bed, but prioritized supporting her husband's art career and raising her children. And you can see among her work, um, she had um, many pieces that named the connection between um, the earth and women's bodies. And we'll see here some more of, of her more abstract work. But these pieces are some that are the most striking. She painted many images of birth from the perspective of the one birthing. Um, and you can see in some of these, images, the, um, the perspective that we don't often see um, of childbirth, of mothering. And here she's using a similar style, but um, depicting the, the, the earth birthing us. So the way that she connected the landscape that women inhabit with their bodies was is deeply moving 
one of her sons died in childhood and her art was an outlet for grief and lament. We see that connection between creativity and motherhood, although, although these were not always complementary. She describes waiting until her children were sleeping and um, returning to her art in a way that really struck me as um, in this year of pandemic speaking, especially to friends of mine who are mothers of small children. And certainly this is something fathers have experienced as well, but um, I've heard from many women that it feels as if we are returning to the 1950s, that when there, is, when there was a time of um, no external childcare during the pandemic, that so much of the working and parenting fell to women in a way that, uh, that was incredibly stressful and difficult. The next artist that I'd like to share is Frida Kahlo. And, uh, and she created pieces on similar themes of loss. She lived with disability and pain. She was unable to birth a child and her work includes some images uh, of pregnancy loss, which I haven't included because they are um, quite graphic, but, um, but they can be found and are, are, um, are also really beautiful. She used um, metaphors for disability. This, this particular painting speaks to the ways that, um, that she describes her body being held together um, after a very difficult and painful accident in her youth. And she used, um, this is from the Frida Kahlo Museum in Mexico City that I visited in 2017. So the photographs are mine and perhaps not as professional, but this, um, this brace corset is something that she decorated um, and she has several of these that she used, um, she would wear both to support her body. Um, and she also, um, We'll see, she dressed in the style, um, a traditional Mexican style. And this is, uh, this is an adapted boot that she wore um, to make her feet um, the same level for walking, but she had also, you can see how she's also painted this. And so her creativity expanded beyond, um, beyond just the canvas to the art that she wore. Kahlo, of course, also had an artist husband and their relationship inspired much of her art. Um, this is an image of Frida with her husband, uh, Diego Rivera, painted on her forehead. They married twice. They divorced after he had an affair with her sister, which uh, I wouldn't recommend. It didn't go well for them, but they did get back together. In describing their marriage, she says, there have been two great accidents of my life. One was the trolley, the other was Diego. Diego was by far the worst. Frida had seasons in her life when she was alone and in bed. She used a mirror to, um, to paint so that she could be propped up with an easel. And she says, I paint self-portraits because I am so often alone and because I'm the person I know the best. Here's another image that, uh, of her, similar to, um, to images of Lucida Hurtado of, of the woman's body and connection to the earth. And this is the last painting she created. It's called Viva la Vida, which translates as live life, but the English is missing something. Um, and, it feels especially celebratory and uh, just an invitation to dig in to life and uh, to the, the ripe watermelon. And uh, this is uh, Mary Pratt's uh, painting entitled Cut Watermelon. And Mary Pratt, a Canadian artist from Newfoundland, uh, I have 
I'm only on a tiny screen, so I'm not sure if you can see, but above me over my couch is a print of Mary Pratt's pomegranates that I can show you later. Um, her work uh, was mostly images of domestic life, but um, she also painted some landscape and, uh, and some images, particularly images of women. She said, when I get in front of the easel and begin to paint, I sometimes burst into tears because I'm so happy to be here. I'm so glad that it's just me, the canvas, the paint, and the dear little brush. This is an early picture of Mary Pratt. One of her most famous works, um, Jelly Shelf, about this, she says, jelly is not just beautiful. It speaks volumes about the value of disciplined hard work. Perfect jelly takes at least two days to make properly. It's hot and somewhat dangerous work. Just have a look at any good cookbook. And uh, her, her pictures are in the style of um, realism. Um, she's sometimes lumped into Atlantic realism, although, uh, although she didn't particularly appreciate being added to any group. Um, but, uh, but her, her, paintings appear to come to life as if you could take that jar of jelly right off the shelf. She also quite famously painted uh, from slides her husband, Christopher Pratt, also an artist, took of their nanny, who he painted, who was also his lover. And uh, Mary Pratt painted images of Donna, um, including one where Donna is wearing Mary Pratt's house coat. Um, I think perhaps the best revenge to her husband's affair was painting, uh, painting his lover and doing a better job of painting than, uh, than Christopher Pratt did. Although that's my opinion of those art pieces, which I won't share. Um, they are a little bit uh, too, feel a bit too risque for perhaps Sunday morning, but there's lovely uh, pictures entitled, This is Donna, <clears throat> that you may look up if you wish. This one though is called Romancing the Casserole. And I have a particular affection for the way that she brought to life the interior of a microwave with a casserole dish inside. <clears throat> These three women were shaped by their context and by the limitations placed on their choices. And now we move to two women who work to change the context for girls today. Elena Favelli and Francesca Calallo noticed that most children's books told the stories from the perspective of male heroes. In an interview they gave on Girl Boss website, they explained, we've always been very passionate about empowering women. On the children's media side, we've witnessed how it's so packed with gender stereotypes. The kind of sexism that we experience in life is, re is reflected in children's products that surround us, in clothes, in movies, and cartoons, and in books especially. We were shocked to see how few female characters come out every year. There are so few children's books that have strong female characters. You don't realize it until someone points it out. And then you say, wow, I've spent my childhood reading books and watching movies, great movies that I love, with male characters as leaders and female characters in subordinate positions where they need to be saved or rescued. The idea for this book was really coming from our personal lives. And at some point, our professional lives began to connect. So their book, which is now a series of four, um, it's called Good Night Stories for Rebel Girls. And they tell in each book a hundred tales of women and girls who challenged stereotypes, stood up for their rights and the rights of their communities. My younger child, Denise, has read each of the stories multiple times. So I asked them who we should hear from today. So we begin with um, 
a few Middle Eastern women who find themselves stuck between a culture that oppresses them and a world that sees them as victims <clears throat> through the lens of Islamophobic hatred. So first is, this is Mona El Tahawi. She's the author of Headscarves and Hymens, Why the Middle East Needs a Sexual Revolution. She had an excellent analysis of the position that she and many others find themselves in when naming harassment and other acts of oppression in Muslim societies. She says, as a feminist of Egyptian and Muslim descent, my life's work has been informed by the belief that religion and culture must never be used to justify the subjugation of women. I can write about my culture and religion because I'm a product of both. Even when I am accused of giving ammunition to the Islamophobic right, in the struggle between community and women, I always choose the women. It is exhausting that Muslim women's voices and our bodies are reduced to proxy battlefields by demonizers and defenders of Muslim men. Neither side cares about women. They are only concerned with one another. And I love this photo. This is Manal Al-Sharif. She's a Saudi Arabian woman who posted a video on YouTube of her protest against the law forbidding women to drive. She encouraged women not to wait for the ban to be lifted, but to get out on the road. And she was arrested and spent time in jail, but was eventually released. The law has now changed, and it's one of many laws that control Saudi women, including requirements of male guardianship, that women need permission from a, a male guardian to go to work. She was marginalized, particularly herself, because she is a divorced single mother. And in her video of her driving protest, she named cases where women had to choose between breaking the law and saving a male family member's life when faced with driving a husband or brother to the hospital. She explained that many women don't work outside the home because they would have to hire a driver to get to work, and that would cost a third of their wages. She now lives in Australia. And this is another woman who used social media to call out injustice. This is Sunita Elizabeth. She's an Afghani woman who at 10 years old was told that her parents had found a husband for her and that she would be sold into marriage. The war in Afghanistan had postponed that plan, but at age 16, she was once again told that she would be, that there was a man interested in marrying her. But uh, she was going to school in a refugee camp in Iran, and she had found a passion for rapping and songwriting. She uploaded her song, Brides for Sale, to YouTube. She won a scholarship uh, to study music at, um, at a university in Utah and says, in my country, a good girl should be silent, but I want to share the words that are in my heart. And she continues now to advocate for girls to have the right to education, the right to a childhood, to end child marriage and poverty that makes the practice of selling daughters seem like the only option. And our last rebel girl is Koi Mathis. She is a girl from rural Colorado. And she told her parents early on that she didn't feel at home being dressed as a boy and asked if there were doctors that could turn her into a girl. Koi's parents advocated for their trans daughter to use the girl's bathroom at school. And when that right was taken away, they filed a complaint accusing the school of violating the state's anti-discrimination law. Koi has turned the world upside down in her community by advocating for herself and for other trans students all before the age of 10. She and other women and girls that we've heard about are continuing the work of a world transformed, doing the work of justice, justice and advocacy in their world. As the authors say in their introduction to Good Night Stories for Rebel Girls, all we can feel is hope and enthusiasm for the world that we're building together.
a world where gender will not define how big you can dream, how far you can go, a world where each of us will be able to say with confidence, I am free. May it be so with us. Sarah, thank you for that visual and heartfelt uh, tour of, of creativity done in the name of, of worth of, of women of all. Um, we saw courage, we saw bravery, we saw talent, we saw creativity, we saw difficulty in all of that. So I thank you for that. And as a, as a response to it, I want to show you something. Just a second, I'm going to show you something. <laughs> there. Okay. You, can you see that? Can you see the basket of rocks? Well, Glenn and I spent a long time this morning looking for the basket of rocks, which has been here for years and years and years. This is Greta's basket of rocks, which we use on Women Rock Sunday. It's getting rather heavy, so I'm going to sit down. Um, uh, but we couldn't find it. And you know, so I, I ran outside, still listening to, this, to the message. But I ran outside and looked for a rock. And I couldn't find any rocks. And then dumped outside the door were all our rocks. Out on the, so I found a basket and filled it. So here are the rocks. Oh, hang on. That's good, Glenn. You've got it. Here are the rocks. And I'm going to put them with Glenn over here. He's going to have the rocks. <laughs> it's really hard to plan um, for, for a space you can't remember during the week. Um, the, 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 uh, the background to what Sarah was saying is, and we know this, that there are hundreds and thousands of people, and I'm thinking of women particularly, who, who made what we just saw ha be able to be happen in the background. And so I have, I have um, how can you get a rock here? Here, here, we'll put them here for you. So I'm wanting us to, to, if you've got your rock, wherever you are, you've got a picture of a rock, you can hold it up, you know what? And if you have a way of making it make a sound, if it's a, if it's a picture, you can make the sound yourself. You can say bang or thud or something uh, with your, or you can smack it against something. And uh, I want to celebrate four different, diff from four different viewpoints. And when I finish the, the viewpoint I'm giving, I'm going to say, and so we say, and you're welcome to respond by saying, women rock and make your own noise. Before I do that, each time, Glenn is going to take a rock from the rock basket and throw it against the stage, just like we've done all these years. And he, I hope, I mean, he's a very strong man. He's a, he's a scout leader, and he can make a noise. And so when he bangs it against the stage, that'll be uh, what we've done all these years. So first, I want to, to remember, and I've got all these lists. I won't name any names, but I was looking in the history of this, and there were women in the 1300s, the 1400s, who would be called feminists today if that word was around when they were trying to work against enormous odds. The 1500s, and I'm looking at the countries of India and Italy, the United Kingdom, Sweden in the 1600s. For every, every woman who, who in ancient times, with very little understanding of, of the cosmos of the world at the time, still struck out against enormous odds in an ancient world and, and, and championed the worth of women. So we say to that, let me hear, uh, go, go, go ahead. Did you hear that? Okay, now, <laughs> women rock. Women rock. Women rock. Women rock. Next, I have a list, which I will not read, of over 50 suffragettes from Sweden, from Germany, from Australia, from Italy, from the United Kingdom, from New Zealand, from France, from uh, uh, the UK again, from uh, Norway, from all these countries who, who, who's, who thought, oddly enough, that women actually could, might think differently than their spouse and have a, a separate vote. And so for all the ones that worked to a vote, which meant some more control over education and, and hunger and all these issues, for all the suffragettes in the world, like Glenn, and we say, women, women rock. 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 
And then I have a long list of leaders and publishers and organizers, people who led organizations, people who founded organizations, so many of them women, but some men as well, all through history, all through the 1930s and 1940s. And why I'm celebrating is this, they all predated Canada getting the vote for women. All these people didn't see the fruition in our country of women getting the vote, which in all of Canada, for all races, didn't happen until the late 1940s. The late 1940s is when Quebec and Indigenous women and that all got into this. So for all the people who wrote and published and organized and led, Glenn, and we all say, women and <laughs> rock. And this last group is a very special group of people who's, who died near to 1948, but they didn't quite make it to where all women in Canada got the vote. And what I'm grouping together with this is for every one of us and everyone out there who is working towards something that hasn't happened yet, and the discouragement that, that can bring and the loneliness that can bring it and the almost wanting I have got people even in my workplace that when when there's too much bullying or there's too much difficulty say I'm just going to come and do my job I'm not going to care about anything anymore because I can't I can't man I can't hold my spirit up and within two days they say oh I can't do that I'm back in I'm back in caring and so for everyone who hasn't yet seen the fruit of their labor but hangs in there for us for women everywhere Glenn and we all say, women, women rock. rock. <laughs> okay. Uh, duly celebrated, uh, half here and half everywhere. Uh, what, what a beautiful thing to hear noises about women rock from uh, across the Atlantic and across our country. And I'm going to ask Peter now to put the slide on and the music for our traditional women rock song. Um, I've credited the writers. We have permission to use it um, uh, for years and years and years. I've got it written down somewhere, um, but we do. And uh, please join in. If you don't know the song, you'll know it. You'll know it soon. It's a good singable gospel uh, tune. To uh, if every woman in the world had her mind set on freedom. And thank you, Babette, for uh, recording it with your daughters.
I just wanted to do that uh, right after. Uh, I hope you've felt the depth, the richness, the warmth of, of what women have, how women have dignified all our lives, how they have enriched them, how they have reminded us over and over of the inequality that exists in our world. Um, we've heard mentioned even this morning, the, the black lives, we've, we've, we've mentioned the Asian women, uh, things that bring, us, bring to light these things, our indigenous people, that, that um, to stand for the worth of all, the equal worth of all people as human beings, of all life as deserving of a place on the planet, uh, that's a big call, but we keep making it to ourselves and to each other and keep inching towards it. And so today we've taken this time to honor every single person who has been part of that, contributed to that. And as you go out into your week and you notice those things, do a little, do a little search. Do a little search about when everyone got the vote in Canada, when all women got the vote in Canada, or wherever country you're watching this from, or search another country and realize that we're pretty good here, not as good as we should be, but there are countries suffering far more than we are. So let's learn together and keep this not just as a special day in the year, but all the time of that, those workers, those people that are striving towards uh, somebody feeling that they matter, that their opinion matters, that their, their hunger matters, that their uh, desire to participate matters. So for all of these, I'll just uh, ask us to end up um, maybe, maybe if you could once again hold your rock up and we'll end by saying, and we all say together, women rock in this abundant blessing we share. We share. Oh, Love to see you all. Lovely to gather like this. Uh, Facebook as well, YouTube as well. Um, join us Tuesday for our wellness group in the afternoon. Take a look at the e-blast to find out how to do that. Uh, Mike leads a coffee hour on, on Thursday, uh, and we're back again on Sunday. Uh, and there's no limit to our Zoom yet, so bring a friend either on your screen if you're allowed and, uh, or uh, join on another screen. For those of you that are here for the first time, I'm not sure if I noticed you. Um, because you look so familiar. Uh, so uh, welcome to, to our, our gathering. And for those of you that have been with us for a long, long time, glad you're still here. Have a wonderful week. Be safe, be warm, be, enjoy spring. Oh, happy spring as well. Happy first day of spring. Delightful. Thank you all. Take care. Farewell. Thank you.